Mary Davis uh, Book Club was studying about Arlington National Cemetery and she knew that I had been stationed there in the Army and asked me if I would come speak to the book club and it really made me feel great, uh, especially because of what I did in the Army. Never really talked about it. How many of you have been in the military? Thank you for your service. how it is. You know, you don't talk about it a lot unless somebody asks you a specific question about it, and then you, you're glad to kind of tell about it. My dad was in the Navy down in the South Pacific. I have to pull it out of him to talk about anything. And a lot of you guys are probably the same way. Um, that's just not what we do. But uh, it was really an honor to get asked to do this. So I put together a little presentation. I kind of attack it from three standpoints. One, how the cemetery became the cemetery how it became the National Cemetery. How many of you have been to Arlington? A lot of you. Yeah, Anybody sure. going Thanks. back anytime soon? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, two, how the old guard of the 3rd Infantry became the unit there. And then the third thing is how I wound up there. So I kind of track it from those three standpoints. So Mike was gracious enough to take some slides and put them together for us. So the cemetery kind of started in 1669 as far as the property. Uh, a ship's captain was given the property for bringing settlers to the New World. And then through a series of sales, uh, the Custis family, who was cousins and grandsons of George Washington, bought the property and in 1831, uh, I believe it was, uh, Lee married a Custis, Mark married. And he lived there for the next 30 years. The cemetery, the way it wound up being a cemetery, was on April 17th when the war broke out. Lee had to make a decision of being head of the Southern Army or staying with the Union forces. Well, on April 20th, he made the decision to be and go and take command of the Virginia Army for the Confederacy. He left on the 22nd and never returned. There was a general named Meggs, Montgomery Meggs, that just hated Lee. He served under him for a number of years, but he was one of those guys that he just didn't like him. And so when the uh, battles started piling up and the dead started piling up, they had to look around for somewhere to intern these people. And it wasn't an honor at that time. It was like you weren't, didn't have enough money for your family to transport you back to Pennsylvania or wherever to be interned. So Meggs decided that he wanted to bury the people on Lee's property. So the Union had already taken over the house and was uh, using it for their headquarters there. And one of the things that Meggs did is he purposely had people in turn near the Rose Garden, which was close to the house, and he really made a lot of commanders mad because they were still there. So that's kind of how it evolved into the cemetery. And then in eight, that was in 1862. In June of 1862, the military or the government uh, deemed it a, a national cemetery. And that's how it kind of evolved into that. Uh, Lee, like I say, Lee never came back there. The government made a law, or had a law at that time, that you had to pay your taxes uh, in person. And the property was actually in the wife's name. And so she can't go back to. Washington to pay taxes or Lee can't go so that the tax never got paid. And in 1888, one of the sons uh, went to the government and sued him and got $150,000 for the property and uh, sold it to the government basically. There are over 330,000 graves in Arlington. The, um, the caisson is representative of higher ranking officers or uh, officials that have um, been interned there. Sometimes <coughs> were the old cannon wagons, and that's what they started using back just to transport the dead and then involved when that was one of the higher funerals you could have. There's about, at any one time in Arlington, there's about 40 horses and 46 uh, guys assigned to that unit. I can go ahead. Can you speak a little louder? Okay. Thank you. Um, this is the military district of Washington symbol. Um, 
the Honor Guard, it, when I was there, Honor Guard Company was E Company. There was A through uh, F companies, and E Company was Honor Guard Company. It was always the tallest guys. You could look out on the parade field, and the tallest company out there was Honor Guard Company. Now they have all the companies in the Old Guard, the Third Infantry there, have the Honor Guard uh, patch. <laughs> The way I wound up there, uh, as you can tell, that's a poster child for the recruiting. Uh, did, you have a, did you have a fly on your helmet you're looking up at? <laughs> that, I don't know that picture was. They all said, look up. And every, just about every guy in our book looks like that. Um, I went in the Army in uh, 1969. Contrary to Mike's uh, telling everybody, it wasn't. 1784 when the unit was formed. It was 1969. I went in at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and it was in the infantry. And they came around interviewing for the old guard. They go down and screen the records, and they look for people that they can get a White House or a top secret clearance for. And then they call you into the gym, give you a spiel, and if you're interested, you stay. And that's kind of how I wound up getting selected there. Actually, my orders came for Vietnam. Uh, I was supposed to go to uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, driving armored personnel carriers for two weeks, and I saw my orders. It said shipment to Republic of Vietnam, June 1970. And about two weeks after that, my orders came for Washington, and it has precedence over um, any other orders you have. Okay. Um, there you go. I'll help you. There's your. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's my company, A33. That was at Fort Pope. That's my AIT kind of, uh, company. For those of you who don't know, AIT is Advanced Individual Training, and mine was 11 Bravo, which is the infantry. And that's me on the far left. That's just around our barracks there. That's what I was supposed to go learn to drive, and actually did a couple of days training in that. Let me back up just a second and uh, say that this whole presentation, like Robin said, when she asked me about it, this is kind of a birthday present to Ken, not to showcase me, but I know his strong belief in the military, and so we appreciate that, Ken. And so this is kind of for you and your friends that have been in the military, uh, when we talked about this, we just thought this would be a good idea. So this is to honor all you guys that have been in the military and show you what your Army does. And that's just our uh, yearbook, so to speak, at, uh, when I was in, down in Fort Polk. This is um, a drill day, and that's me right over there. The way the, the Army 3rd Infantry came to be at Arlington, in uh, 1784, the unit was formed, and it's the oldest active Army unit uh, in existence today. They were formed as kind of a, almost a, not a technical military police, but that type of unit to guard the expanding western borders of the U.S. They were in uh, a number of uh, skirmishes with the Indians, the Mexican Wars. And you see the bayonets on the rifles? Uh, they're, not, they're not on that picture, are they? Uh, I'll you go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> the marching, when you weren't at a ceremony, you were marching and uh, doing drill. Uh, Simon Says was a big thing. Anybody ever play Simon Says when they were drilling in the <laughs> Army? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, so that was a real uh, trick to use to uh, get everybody to listen up. And that's just getting the right perspective. <laughs> okay. How's it going so far? <laughs> you can go ahead. Here again is the caisson, and that's the ceremony. You can see the, the four on each side, the casket uh, guys. On the cast platoon, uh, typically, if it's a caisson, there are eight. If it's uh, a ceremony where it's like out of a hearse, it'll be um, six. It can be eight out of that, but uh, most of the time it's six. Yeah. 
This, uh, now you see the bayonets on the rifles. That Army, uh, the 3rd Infantry, is the only military unit in the country that's authorized to perform with fixed bayonets. Uh, in 1844, I think it was, there was a bayonet charge, a successful bayonet charge by the unit uh, in the Mexican War. And I think it was 1922, the Army authorized the Old Guard to march and perform with fixed bayonets. So whenever you see a unit uh, marching, they will have that. This is, uh, I believe this was at the Pentagon. You can see the cannons up in the top right. This is a review for a foreign dignitary. It depends on what rank you are, and whether you're a civilian head of state or a military head of state, what kind of uh, ceremony you get. That's in front of my aunt and uncle's house. They lived out in Bethesda, Maryland, so I used to go over there and stay on the weekends, and so that's just a picture of me being cute. <laughs> this is down at the White House. Uh, a lot of uh, ceremonies at the White House, uh, the Easter egg hunt, we would go down and be the ones to help set up stuff for the Easter egg hunt in the spring. So it, it's, a lot of people don't realize what the unit does. We've been security at uh, the Chicago Bank Group uh, at the Sheraton uh, for the young uh, uh, governors. That uh, it's the uh, what do they call it, uh, boy state type thing. Uh, when they come to Washington, we were in Chicago one night. We went to Hershey, Pennsylvania, putting on the flag show. Uh, been to Baltimore Colts football games, the Citadel. So we do all types of ceremonies. It's the official ceremonial unit of the military. You're going to tell the Rose Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Rose story. I was about to forget about that. I was down there one day, and we were standing around waiting for things to get started, and my buddy and I were standing over by the, on the inside, and there's one of those uh, snow fence, a little picket fence, wire fence. And so the guardhouse was probably all from here, the back corner there. And I reached over to get a rose. I told my buddy, I want a rose from the White House. Well, I was watching the guard, and as soon as I reached over that fence, he turned around. I pulled my hand back. He turned back around. I reached over again. He pulls around. Well, after about the third time, he gets out and he comes down, and he said, what are you guys reaching over this fence? Now, this is the one well inside the ground. And I said, yes, sir, I wanted a rose from the White House. And he said, well, would you get the damn thing before I get back to the guardhouse? Just keep setting off the alarm. <laughs> And so I got it. <laughs> this is down at the White House. And there's the rose you got. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is at the White House. This is a reception. Here again, the duties that we would perform there, this is the this is our unit right here. You've seen the guys standing around the driveway holding the flags. We'd be door guards, just security and different perimeters. I'm not sure what I was doing that day, but you can see the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, everybody has a unit that's uh, down there. This is um, a retirement parade. This is at uh, Summerall Field in Fort Myers. And uh, the, this whole post has a, a, really a lot of history at the cemetery, just that property, the way it evolved. In 1908, uh, one of the early, uh, or the first, military person that was killed in an airplane crash. Ken, were you there? Would that, would that, <laughs> <laughs> that make an impact on your aviation career? Actually, I'd already retired. Uh, <laughs> Orville and, and Wilbur had, were there dem demoing the airplane to the Army, and uh, Orville and a Lieutenant Selfridge uh, went up flying one day and a prop broke and cut a cable and it had no control and it crashed uh, and Selfridge was killed. So he was the first uh, a, a military person killed in an airplane crash and Orville had back problems for the rest of his life. He, uh, uh, Take a step injured his back severely. There you go. Sorry. But I didn't know whether that was one of the early things that uh, was Probably. Got, uh, Gary, I have a friend sitting here with his 
aviator hat on. <laughs> he, he, he flew a lot of those soft wheels. He ended up with Continental. But, uh, <laughs> he flew a lot of open cockpits that blew most of his hair off. <laughs> the, uh, uh, at, at, on the parade field there, uh, most I remember when President Kennedy was assassinated, the riderless horse was blackjack. And that horse was cremated and his ashes were spread over that field. Mm. And this, Fort Myers is the military post at Arlington. It's where the um, old guard is housed. Uh, this is called the tally ho wagon, uh, depending on where you are here again in rank and what you're doing, whether was, this was probably a retirement for this guy or a change of command for the old guard. Now what would happen here, if he comes by, he'll go back around, go up to the reviewing stand and stand there, and then they will do a procedure uh, where they attach the bayonets, and it's a really pretty cool uh, operation if you've never seen it. But uh, there's a whole count thing. In fact, uh, when I first got married, uh, everything in the military became a count, even in your civilian life. It was sleepers, tent, hut, sleepers, ready, one, and you'd sit on the bed. Ready, two, you'd lie down. Ready, three, you'd put your feet up on the bed. Ready, four, sleep, you know. So, and, but that's the way the fixed bayonets went. You had a whole procedure of pulling the bayonet out, and you wanted to hear one click when you seated that thing on the top of that rifle. And they would grade the parades. They would have guys from the military district of Washington that would grade the parades. And uh, Honor Guard Company usually won. I mean, we just did the best stuff. Tallest guys, too. Uh, this is at the Lincoln Memorial. It was a wreath ceremony. You can see the reflecting pool frozen over. Okay, you go ahead. And this is at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Um, this is a wreath ceremony from the, from the lower step side. The amphitheater <coughs> is back behind there. I fainted one time uh, up there, and I had just gotten there in May of 70, and I was a door guard at the amphitheater, and I made the mistake of locking my knees. Mm -hmm. And luckily, an off-duty tomb guard reached up and just caught me. The next thing I know, I'm down in the <laughs> tomb guard area with smelling sauce. <laughs> I never locked my knees after that. Yeah. <laughs> and here again, this is a brief ceremony. This is, a, there's a parade area around from the main Summerall parade area. It's called, there's a huge flagpole there. We call it a flag ceremony if it was at that parade field. So here again, depending on who you are and uh, your rank and from your visiting country, you get to uh, a parade there. There's the flag I was talking to, talking about. Okay. Uh, this is at the White House again, just looking down the line, the troop. Uh, the pictures you see over there, I had a friend uh, that was in my unit that became buddies with a guy that was in the photography area for the military district, district of Washington, and he would give us a lot of those uh, pictures that I'm lucky enough to have. On the backs of some of them, it says, uh, who... <laughs> it says uh, what that ceremony was for. <laughs> Somebody was talking about the Christmas wreaths being put out at the, at the cemetery. Uh, Memorial Day, we were the guys that put all the flags out. We just walk out, just rows of us, just rows and rows and handfuls of these. Walk up, step in front of the headstone, put the flags out. I've done as many as six funerals in a day there. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in 70 and 71, kind of the height of Vietnam. Um, it, very sobering experience. I mean, we took our job very seriously. Uh, we had a good time, but when we were performing ceremonies, it was we wanted to be the best. We wanted it to be uh, something the family would remember. Tell about the uh, funeral in the rain. Yeah. I was the NCO in charge one day. 
you have the full caisson, you have uh, and we have the ceremonies at the church, and you take the casket out of the hearse, take it in the church, it comes out, gets on the caisson, goes down to the cemetery. You can have uh, just where there's a ceremony off post, and, uh, but you can be interned in Washington. And we had one like that one day, and there was a, one of the chaplains that was there was noted. They had 20 minutes, I think it was. They, he was noted for taking the whole 20 minutes. It was cold and rainy, snowy. I was the NCO in charge. There were the six casket guys, the bugler, the firing squad, and that NCO, and the chaplain. And a couple of guys said, hey, Dickens, says, tell the captain to cut this short today. It's pretty cold out here. So I did that. <laughs> I <made a> mistake. <laughs> so I walked over and I said, sir, you know, it's pretty cold out here today. If you want, there was no family. This guy was from like, I don't know, Kansas or. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> He's from Kansas. <laughs> but, you know, so I said, sir, if you want to cut this a little short today, it's fine with the guys. And he said, sergeant. This may be the last time anybody says anything nice about this person. I believe in taking the whole time. And I said, sir, thank you very much. Take as long as you want. If you go longer, that's fine. <laughs> that was a true statement. <laughs> uh, this is a wreath ceremony at the tomb. Uh, where I fainted was right back up there in that corner there. <laughs> Actually, I'm in this group today. What happens when there's a wreath ceremony at the tomb? Uh, the, the tomb guards will be relieved. They'll do a little ceremony where they're relieved and they stand over in a little guardhouse over to the side. They're not walking back and forth. So these two ranks, and I think the next slide shows it, will split. One, one group will come to the right and uh, one group will go to the left. And then the dignitary will come down and lay the wreath. Well, what would happen, everybody was always late. So if you had a good officer, you didn't just stand there at attention for an hour. Uh, you know, he'd bring you from uh, uh, attention to a ceremonial at ease. That's where you got your rifle and you move and just bring back your attention. He'd change shoulders where you just so you move so you didn't faint because it would get pretty hot out there on that marble. This is a ceremony at the Jefferson Memorial. Um, is this back to the beginning? Or this no. This, well, you know what? I think there's a couple in there twice. Yeah. This is me right here. This. Um, was the company had won the company softball championship or something, so they were getting a trophy. <laughs> Here's the casket, guys. This is what's called the office job. This is up behind the Custis Lee Mansion. We had a full-blown caisson funeral one day. Marching platoon, the eight casket guys. We come out, we get up to, we take the casket out of the hearse, put it up on the caisson, and the wife steps forward to the captain and goes, that's not my husband. <laughs> we, they had put the wrong casket. Ooh. Out of frame from this building, there's a big, huge building where they keep remains when they've been shipped there until they intern them. And they had pulled the wrong casket. So we just, they, they, they did it really cool. They, we didn't even strap it down. But they took us, we started marching, went around behind this building, put that casket back in the facility. They brought the right one out. We came out from behind the building. The marching platoon fell in behind us, and we go down to the cemetery to the grave site. <laughs> oh, that's a good save. Pardon? That's a good save. <laughs> yeah, it really was. All the caskets are saved. All of them what? All the caskets are saved. No, sir. Yeah. It's whatever the family wants. Okay. And we had a guy one time. Uh, that eight of us about couldn't pick up. And the way we practiced that, we had a casket in the barracks. Uh, I don't I think there's a picture of the barracks here, but we had an attic and we had a casket up there and we'd, somebody would get in it and we'd practice lifting that thing. You know, we wouldn't shut it, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> but somebody would get in there. But we had a guy one time and it was a mahogany <laughs> casket. And, uh, but you can, you can pick, I mean, it's whatever your family picks. Uh, that's... Like I said, there's the eight guys, <clears throat> the procedure where we fold the flag, and the bugler plays taps. And there they are leaving the grave site. Section 60 is a, one of the newer sections at the cemetery, and it's kind of been designated as most of your uh, people that are uh, killed in action, uh, killed in uh, Afghanistan, 
Iraq, they're there, but also remains of unknowns that are being identified from Vietnam and different wars are being interned there. Um, my cousin, uh, who, who since passed away, sent me that book, and it's really, really awesome. But uh, they had a really a, a problem. I'm not taking too long, Amber Robert. No, you're fine. They had a little bit of a problem. So many people that are killed in action recently, just like at the uh, Vietnam Wall, they're bringing flowers, memorabilia, anything, medals, and everything. That cemetery picks up every item and catalogs it and saves it. Well, they were just getting inundated because they were keeping everything. Well, they had a superintendent there that kind of started just trashing everything, and then they said, wait a minute. So they, now they keep everything. They do throw the flowers out after they wilted, and they can get rid of that, or anything that's perishable. But everything else is bagged and tagged, and they keep it. Tomb guards, these, that's just three frames, obviously. Um, tomb guards, it, it's a 21 count step. It's 21 steps down, 21 back, a count of 21 when they turn and they face down. Uh, they are on a 30 minute uh, change of the guard during the day. At night, it's two hours, and they don't have to walk, they don't have to walk it at night. There's a little guardhouse, and they can go over and just stand in that. The only requirement is they have to keep the rifle on the shoulder away from the tomb, and that's symbolic of keeping out an intruder. As I said, there's over 300,000, um, 360,000, I think it is, um, graves there. Anybody that's been in the military can be interned in Arlington if you're cremated. Um, at least that was the last rule. Right now. It used to be that if you'd ever served, you could be there, but uh, they're just running out of room. And uh, if you are Purple Heart, or not, maybe Purple Heart or Medal of Honor winner, you can be interned there. Uh, but you can be cremated and uh, have an area there for that. Just hold on to that one a second. Um, The old guard, like I said, had a, a really uh, illustrious history, and one one of the generals went to Lincoln after um, I think it was the Second Battle of Bull Run, and he went to Lincoln and he said, "Mr. President, these are the men that saved your army." And Lincoln said, "Yes, I know who these men are." Lincoln immersed himself in tactics. When the war started, he didn't know anything about it. Most of his generals didn't know anything about fighting the war. And he said the main thing in war, the main thing is to remember the main thing. And so many of his generals wanted to do this and this and this and just kind of piecemeal stuff out. So he studied up and he became really the general of the whole army and kind of dictated how it was going to go and focused on the blockades and that type of stuff. But he was very... Uh, involved in who these men were. And like I say, in, I think it was 1946 after World War II, the unit was designated as the official unit uh, for Arlington. The, the platoon guards, the Fife and Drum Corps, the uh, marching platoon, casting platoon, the firing squad the guys, uh, there's a military police unit there, uh, the marked, the, uh, as you say, the platoon guards, and uh, the Pershing Zone Marching Band are all units in that uh, company. <clears throat> Is that the last one? I think. Let me just read some of it. This, this sums up Arlington. This, this little poem, this is a 1971 program from a ceremony at the cemetery. And it's born of one man's love and honor for America's first president home of a loving family long gone, grieved far by my mistress, last, least my hero be defied, encompassed by war's sounds and fury, defiled long ago by one man's hate for another.